So thank you for joining us for tonight's uh, Taxing Matters for Disaster Impacted Households webinar with United Policyholders. Trying to make my screen advance and this is gonna be fun, apparently. There we go. So if you'd like to download and follow along with the slide deck, you can grab it here. And if you are interested in any previous events and recordings, please check out events. A little bit about United Policyholders. We're a, at this point, almost 33-year-old uh, nonprofit uh, with um, expertise in insurance and disaster recovery. And we try to serve to, as a trusted information resource and voice for insurance consumers in all 50 states. Uh, one of the unique things about us is that um, we are funded exclusively by donations and grants. And for an insurance consumer advocacy group, that's a rarity. And then the other unique thing about us is our team up. So uh, we have our professional staff like myself and Amy, who's uh, supporting us today, um, our government and nonprofit partners, and then we have team up. So we have our volunteers who are previous catastrophic loss survivors and consumer focused professionals like John, who's actually both. He's a, a earthquake uh, impacted survivor and also a uh, CPA who's been uh, a, a valuable resource for us in this space. And so thank you, John, for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, a little bit about our three programs. We start with our roadmap to recovery, which is where we provide this guidance on insurance and that the financial decision-making to help you get back home after a catastrophic loss, um, that those lessons learned feed into our roadmap to preparedness program, which is helping households reduce the risk and be resilient to disasters and adversity. And then advocacy in action is where we take those pain points that people experience during that roadmap to recovery and fight for consumer concerns, rights, and protections. Uh, this is our uh, disaster help libraries as a resource for you. They have state-specific uh, state resources, samples and examples, our survivor speaks tips that are also available for you. Um, and so please take advantage of those resources if you have not already. Fine print, this workshop is intended to be general guidance only. We're not providing legal or professional advice. Um, and just remember our speakers are volunteering their time as educators. Um, no one is setting up to be in a contractual relationship with you. Today's presenter, my name is Valerie Brown. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of United Policyholders. With me today is John Trapani of Trapani of uh, uh, Certified Public Accounting. John, did I get that correct? I'm going to go to your slide Close next. <laughs> oh, here we go. And so John is a CPA um, who's been doing disaster taxes for as long as we've existed. Uh, he's licensed in California and Colorado and a disaster survivor, as I mentioned. And he's assisted hundreds of taxpayers with the income tax reporting requirements for disaster, which are very unique and complex. And so this is him for his information you would like to um, get in contact with him later. Um, and just a few notes about um, keeping you on track, right? Uh, keeping your paperwork organized is going to help you collect more money from your insurance claim. Uh, so we encourage you to keep a, a claim journal, save and either save all receipts or scan, photocopy them, email them to yourself so you have a copy for your records, especially with your tax situation here with dealing with this, it's very important to have all that documentation. We recommend you consider a, opening a separate bank account for your funds so that you can track precisely what you've received for what, um, establishing a special email account if you need to, uh, document and tracking all those insurance claims. Um, and if you need help with any of that, we and the samples and examples, we do have a sample insurance accounting spreadsheet that another CPA from the Woolsey Fire had created for us to share. So the goals of today's presentation, really to help you understand tax compliance requirements and benefits available for disaster impacted households and make good financial decisions, including when to file, timelines, uh, what your tax related options are for insurance claims, what the difference is between a casualty loss and an involuntary gain conversion, um, why you need help. 
And so let's get going here. So these are today's topics. We're going to talk about how disasters impact your taxes and then other considerations. So I'm not going to read through these. Just wanted to outline the rough uh, format that we're going to follow today. So going to start with um, just uh, a call out on a couple of basic insurance pieces. Uh, John can sit back. This is uh, not, not the complex uh, calculations we need to talk about later. So on, for California specifically, there's something called Prop 19 enacted during the 2020 ballot measure. Um, and it is a significant property tax savings for many homeowners um, that um, if you were a homeowner aged uh, 55 and older, if you're disabled, you're a victim of a natural disaster, it enables you to transfer the property tax basis of your existing primary home to a new home anywhere in California without a price restriction. Um, I know um, Stephen had asked a question about this. Um, and so anything related to this, if you've, if you've gone through this and been denied, be aware that if you have an issue with this, that is a question for your county's tax assessor. And so if you're having any problems with this, you're gonna need to contact your county and appeal the decision that they've given you, okay? So John, um, looking for short answers here, but I'm gonna read through some of our common tax questions that we're gonna deal with today. So are some or all of my insurance ta uh, proceeds taxable? Some of them may be. All right, so some that it depends, right? Major, uh, but most of them probably are not. All right. The right thing. All right, will my insurance company send me a tax document? Uh, you're talking about a 1099? Correct. Unbelievable, but they do not. Got it. Thank you. That's not uh, that's uh, not heartening to hear. <laughs> well, it is. That's, it's scary. Is what it is. Yeah, it's it, it, it's not. That's not helpful. Um, how can I have had such a devastating loss and still have my insurance proceeds be considered a gain? And I know we're going to talk about that later, but. Well, it, the, the problem arises when mainly when people have owned a house for a long time. So their cost basis, what they paid for it and their improvements is not exactly the same as what the house is worth at the time of the fire. And the insurance proceeds are greater than that number. So the difference between that cost basis and the insurance proceeds is considered a, 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 a gain. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's taxable. It just means it's a gain. Got it. And we will go into that, I know, in some more detail as we go. And so are there tax exclusions available? Uh, there, there are there's a, some basic ones that are available to anybody who sells a house uh, and has met some qualifications. Those qualifications requirements are bent a little bit in favor of the taxpayer in these cases. So, uh, and then there is also the deferral of gain and how that will uh, affect things and going, going forward so that you're not likely to pay taxes on much, if anything, from the, uh, the actual uh, proceeds, but it does require adequate reporting. Got it, thank you. And that gets back into that documentation and reporting is key. All right, so if you're underinsured in one or more categories, and categories meaning my dwelling, my contents, can I offset those losses on the tax return? Possibly. Okay, are litigation proceeds taxable? Uh, again, it depends. Uh, the litigation proceeds generally are very complex. They usually involve four or five different categories, and those have got to be discerned and, and broken down and uh, some of them will be uh, the same as insurance and will be treated the same as if they were paid by the insurance companies and company and others will be possibly taxable such as uh, uh, i'm sorry i'm thinking of something called uh, emotional distress uh, right prejudgment interest uh, loss of income sometimes you're you're claiming loss of income those will likely be uh, be taxable 
Got it. Thank you. Uh, what considerations are there if I sell my lot without rebuilding? And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So light, light response. Well, well, the sale of the lot is basically um, caused by the by the loss of the home, and so the sale of the lot can be combined with the other proceeds received from the insurance and treated as one lump sum, and the gain deferred and treated as one involuntary conversion transaction. Got it. And then actually I'll go here, the proposed federal legislation, HR 7024, um, I'll, I'll, I'll cue you up. We have no idea what it's gonna look like because it's not here yet. And we don't know what the IRS is gonna do with it. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. The last thing I heard is that, well, it has been, it has been uh, passed in the house. It's now sitting at the Senate. The last thing I heard was that there's one senator that is concerned about one part of the bill that has nothing to do with the area that we're concerned with, but it, it is holding up the bill as a whole. Got it. Thank you. And so um, I, that one is not hot off the press. We're still waiting to hear back. All right. Well, let's let's get going here. So tax relief timing matters, right? Um, and so while all of this is new, um, there's a lot going on and it's easy to ignore the need to deal with the tax reporting, but it's part of the recovery process and the tax code provides a number of opportunities to save taxes now and in the future. Um, so for those impacted by a federally declared disaster, um, the IRS tax rules allow additional time for certain filings. Um, so if you receive a penalty notice and you're eligible for these extensions, you can appeal. Um, but so the, the big things here in the timing matters, right? You've got to do an accurate assessment of the loss. All recoverable dollars have been recovered before those final tax impacts can be determined, right, John? And that includes lawsuits, outstanding insurance proceeds, everything related to the loss. Correct. Correct. I'll leave it there. All right. And then for uh, especially for those joining from Maui who um, are just looking at this for the first time, um, just to know how do you find copies of your prior tax returns? Start with your CPA, your bookkeeper. If you use an online filing service, um, you know, you can pull those so that you have that that paperwork that you would have lost during the disaster. Um, you can also submit form 4506 to obtain copies directly from the IRS. Um and and just um, yeah, and the fees are typically waived if you're in a federally declared disaster zone. So you know, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say when you're when you're filing that or when you're submitting that forty five oh six, you want to indicate uh, Maui uh, fire or something like that, and, and and the IRS will waive any fee. Got it. Thank you. And then. It, when you're reconstructing records, the IRS actually has um, information for you on how to do it. So if you go to this irs.gov newsroom reconstructing registers links, it will take you to um, a detailed article that explains how precisely to do that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it's as good as you would like it to be, but uh, yeah, that is a that is a tough thing to do. But uh, depending upon how how long you've owned the property. Uh, there's uh, unbelievable now. There's a lot of stuff that we can get off the internet. All right. Well, thank you. And let's see. Purpose of the tax rules. Just, just to set what's what, right? Um, and I'm going to start with John's caution, which is our last statement on this slide. These are the rules that look simple until you start to apply them, right? So the yes. purpose of the rules is to collect money for the operation of government Everything you receive of value has a tax consequence and is taxable unless specified in the tax code. And But in a disaster situation, the tax code is mostly reversed, right? Exactly. So, and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's this, uh, this always this, this fear of the IRS. Uh, they're, they're taking my money. They're, I've got to pay the IRS. And in these cases, everything gets turned upside down because... Uh, Congress has told the IRS in these situations, 
be helpful to the to the taxpayer, uh, help them not pay taxes. Uh, they Congress has provided rules that if the taxpayer uh, complies with them, that uh, they'll be able to keep most of the money, all the money. And in fact, in some cases, they'll actually get money from the government to help them recover. And just to just to qualify for everyone, when we're talking about a disaster, just understand that Congress and their and their wisdom has designated that disasters that get the special treatment um, are designated with a DR, a disaster recovery designation from FEMA. Other designations, if you were an EM or an FM um, and, and not a radio station, um, they're not relevant to these restrict these um these special flipping of the rules okay and so um you just go to the FEMA website and you look at the name of your disaster and see what type of disaster declaration you have i would just add that if if you have a, if you are in a gain position then uh there you get most the, you get to take advantage of most of these rules um even if it's not a disaster Got it. Thank you. And let me go to our next slide. Uh, so, and John, this is uh, going to start. Um, I'm going to be the Vanna to to your um, your learned discourse here. So, we're <laughs> going to start with: In what tax year should I claim a loss? The event year versus the loss deduction year. Um, well, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a a tough concept because here we've we've had our we've had our event, the fires burn down our property. Um, and the immediate thing is, well, we probably maybe we have a casualty loss. But uh, the tax code is very specific that you cannot calculate what the, the casualty loss is until you have settled all of the claims for reimbursement. So if you're getting money from an insurance company, you have to settle with the insurance company. If you're going to be uh, filing a lawsuit against a uh, a third party who's being held responsible for the 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 fire, that case has got to be settled. Uh, and the and if though if after all of those uh, settlements have been have uh, have completed, it turns out that you do have a loss. Then the year that you finally settle all those claims, that becomes your loss year. So maybe you had the fire in two thousand twenty three but you're um, settling the insurance company and you're dealing with a, a suit and it, that doesn't get filed and or completed until 2025, uh, then, then you compute everything in 2025 and that becomes the, the lost year. Uh, it's a concept that was introduced by, by the uh, IRS back in 2016 and it's uh, a, 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 a good rule. It, it, well, they modified something before the the law was was there, but they now they they made it more specific by calling that the loss year. And and that information, Amy, will put that in the chat. We have a, a link to that publication. Um, and so while we're on this topic, I just want to call out because we did have the uh, Q and A open. So um, so for Deborah. Your first question, um, you cannot claim damages from the fire under the flood. You would be looking at amending that, that return for the fire. Um, Katie, this should address your fourth question. And Bridget, uh, it should answer the, the first part of your question. Um, and then uh, just, just as for Deborah, uh, for the, your second question, you would need to file that amended return. Um, if you've, as John said, you have already settled your loss. Now, an interesting thing is that the, the general rule, let's take a 2023 loss. If you settled everything in 2023, uh, you would be able to deduct the loss in either 2020. If you had a loss, you would be able to deduct it in 2023 or 2022. But let's say that you didn't settle in 2023. You settled in, like I said before, 2025. Well, then you could deduct the loss on your 2025 return or your 2024 return. 
because the rule is you have the option to sell to claim the loss in the year of the loss, which is defined as the the loss year, which is the loss the year that you've settled everything, or the year immediately preceding. And if you were claiming the loss, if you wanted to claim the loss uh, or had the ability to claim the loss on your 2022 return, which has already been filed, you would have until April, until October of 2024 to take that make that claim. All right, and now we're just going to jump into the meat of the matter. Um, so do you have a casualty loss? Because most people, as we mentioned earlier with the, the common questions, um, think because you're underinsured, you would you would have a loss on your taxes because you're underinsured. And so the question is, do you have actually ha actually have a casualty loss or do you have an involuntary conversion gain? Um, and just bef before, John, before I turn it over to you, just to point out if your primary residence was not destroyed, um, that the the exclusions that John will talk about are not available. Um, and and so I'm going to I'm going to leave it at that and just let you um, dive into uh, starting with the cost basis, you know, have the one of the the first question is, have the proceeds you've received or expect to receive exceeded the cost basis of the home you've lost? Um, if they don't exceed the cost basis, you may have a casualty loss. If they do exceed it, you have an involuntary gain conversion. And I'll let you dive in a little deeper there. So most of the time people end up with an involuntary conversion gain unless their ins insurance is, uh, hasn't, hasn't kept up or possibly if they've acquired the property real real recently and the and for some reason they're uh, they find that they're underinsured and it's possible to to be underinsured i mean you could buy a property uh you know 2 weeks before the fire for $500,000 um and it burns down and maybe the lot is still worth maybe $200,000 um, but to rebuild that house, it's going to cost eight hundred thousand dollars because of the construction costs, uh, the rising construction costs after the after the fire. So it's not not difficult to be underinsured. Um, but if the property is um, uh, has a cost basis of five hundred thousand, one of the things, if it is, and I'm going to emphasize mostly personal use real estate. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about rental property or commercial property, business property, concentrating on the, mostly the primary personal residence. Although some things we'll talk, talk about will also affect maybe a second home or vacation home situation. Uh, so in the case of the primary residence, uh, a personal use residence, we get to include the cost of the property, the whole property. We don't have to break out the law, the cost, any possible cost of the land. And I say possible because when you buy a house, you buy the whole house. You buy the house, the land, the landscaping, et cetera. And there's no intent in your mind, well, I paid so much for the lot. No, you, you bought the lot for whatever you, you paid for the house. And in that case, we use the whole cost as our cost. So you could end up with a lot of insurance proceeds and uh, and yet you've absorbed all of the cost of the property and you have a, a zero remaining cost basis left, but you still own the property. Um, we, we do have a choice here. We have, um, not well, it's not a choice. It's, it's how things work out. Uh, we either have a casualty gain or uh, an involuntary conversion gain or a casualty loss. Uh, and we'll see that uh, if, as Val said, if the cost basis exceeds the proceeds, then we possibly have a casualty loss, but not necessarily. And if the proceeds are greater than the, than the cost basis, then we have an involuntary conversion gain. But we have some things that might offset that uh, are we, um, and 
if it's primary personal residence, uh, there's a provision in the tax code when you, regardless of it being a, 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 a casualty or a, a disaster, there is this provision when you sell your house, you can exclude up to $500,000 of gain uh, as long as you comply with certain uh, rules. Those generally, those rules are that you have owned the property for at least two years. You've actually occupied the property for two out of five years, and you have not used the provision for at least two years. Uh, and when I say five hundred thousand, I'm talking about a husband and wife. If it's a single person, it's only two fifty. So it's actually two fifty per person. Um, so that comes into play in these situations because these are considered in effect, dis well, they call them dispositions, but that's a fancy word for saying you sold the, you sold your property to the insurance company, but you still but you still own it, but you sold the value to the insurance company, the, the cost basis. So you get to use that that exclusion. Now, many cases, people uh, have a, 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 a purchase of the property and they uh, have this loss that this uh, event that happens, but it's not two years. Well, there's a an, ex a an exception, and it's called the unforeseen circumstances exception. And what happens is, let's say that you've moved in exactly six months prior to the to the fire, and you now have a a gain. Well, uh, you moved in, you lived in the house for six months out of that twenty four month period. So you actually get to prorate that two fifty or five hundred thousand dollar exclusion. So if we're talking about the five hundred thousand dollar exclusion, we would be able to take one fourth because six over twenty four is one fourth. We would take twenty five uh, twenty five percent or uh, one hundred twenty five thousand uh, dollar gain exclusion, and uh, that is only available. Um, because of the unforeseen circumstances. Or let's say that um, you've um, you sold another property within two years. Uh, again, that would not prohibit you taking the, the gain here. Um, I had a client who lived out of the country for uh, about four, well, he had been out of the country for four years. So um, when he when the fire happened, he had actually lived in his house in uh, that had burned down one year out of the five years. Now, if he had got if he had sold his house as opposed to it burning down, he would not have been able to use the exclusion because out of the out of that five year period, he had only lived there one year, and he would have been, would have been locked out. But because of the unforeseen circumstance rule, he was able to use one year. Out of the out of the five years, and see, he got one uh, one year out of two years, so he got fifty percent of his exclusion. So there are some advantages that are available in these situations that are just totally not available in the normal course of selling selling a house. Um, what what else do we have on this slide? Um, you're you're good on that. I I'm actually going to jump us to okay. what do we need to know now, right? Okay. Consider filing an a, an extension before the deadline to file for your 2023 return. If you're not sure what you're doing, uh, you want to file your return or extension timely and report what you know. Uh, and John, this is the, you want to do things right from date, from year zero, right? Absolutely. Uh, and so, because uh, the IRS has harsh rules on reporting incorrectly. Um, so you, because you don't want to, you want to complete your paperwork in the required time frame so that they, you know, your gain suddenly doesn't become taxable because you didn't do it right. So, yeah. and don't rush to claim a casualty loss as it may, as you said, outlined, turn out to be an involuntary conversion gain. So instead you're going to document, maintain your records of all your proceeds, costs expended, extra expense, everything related to the property loss, keep a, keep your journal. And then, and then John, you know, when you're, you know, say you haven't settled, what are you doing? You know, if you had, say you filed your 2023 return, uh, you are, you're a, a Maui, a Maui wildfire impacted household. Um, you're, you're filing it, but you don't know anything right now. So what are you doing? Well, 
there's stuff that you, you either know or you can estimate uh, and you have maybe you've, you've uh, uh, collected some insurance proceeds, but not all the insurance proceeds. Um, the reporting for these events is different than any other kinds of kind of transaction. Uh, when you're an employee, you get a W-2 each year and that's the end of it. You report the income and you're done. Uh, these events are transactions that are really developing over a multiple of multiplicity number of years. And uh, I call them episodic. Um, and each year needs to be the status of, of the of where you are needs to be reported to the IRS. They want to know what you've what you've uh, what you've received, what you've spent. Uh, you have elections to make, and if you don't make those elections properly, the IRS can come back and and, and deny you the benefits of that you would have gotten had you made those had you made those elections. One of them, uh, in particular, is declaring what is your replacement property, uh, and that's an important part of the the puzzle. And if you don't declare that re that that uh, property on the tax return. For the year that you acquire that tax that that property, or you start making replacements, rebuilding, and declare the existing property as your, your replacement property, the IRS could come back and says you have not uh, acquired replacement property, and therefore your insurance proceeds are taxable. So there is a lot of a lot of carrots involved here, but there are also some really uh, nasty sticks that. Uh, that can can arise, uh, and uh, sometimes the uh, the sticks are, are can be horrendous. Well, and so let's go to like stage one, right? So first, you're going to document. You need to document the cost basis for that real property, and and that's a, a determining a reasonable good faith computation of what your cost basis was at the time of the loss. And this is separate and distinct from what your insurance adjuster has provided you because that, you know, we just, when when you're looking at just the insurance claims process, it may have uh, room, square footage, finishers, fixtures, uh, finishings and fixtures might be incorrect. So, and, and it's not the same, right? So you're looking well, at the, the, how the much you pay. The, yeah. the insurance is, is, is they're, they're concerned with replacement costs. They're, they don't care what you paid for the property. They're talk, They're concerned. They're paying you based upon what it theoretically is going to cost you to replace that property. So uh, information, like you say, the, the square footage and things like that is useful, but you should look and make sure to ver verify the information, keeping in mind that sometimes uh, uh, adjusters may be a little... Uh, skinny on terms of you know coming up with the square footage in order to reduce the amount of the of the claim I mean, you know, it happens um right. but the uh, you want to get your your cost basis um so you start out with what you paid for the house and then the improvements that you made now typically people keep this information the same places where as the fire as the house that burned down so a lot of the information um, is uh, is lost. Uh, I've, we, we do some testing with uh, different uh, online services to check uh, cost basis. When was the house? When was the last time the house was sold, and how much did it sell for? Well, that's a starting po point for cost basis of the purchase price. It doesn't include all of the costs, the closing costs, and stuff like that. Uh, but it's it probably catches captures ninety nine percent of the of the purchase price the then you what I suggest you doing do is sit down and and think what did we do to this house up to the date that the house burned down and take your time and because you know, you, you may forget something and you know look at it and think of maybe even take it room by room or you know what remodeling did did you add a add a bedroom did you add a, a bed a master bedroom suite uh, did you put a new roof on? Uh, how, how many fruit trees did you did you plant? Um, things like that. It gets gets down to the minutia, you know, of you know of, of counting the rose bushes if you can, that you that you put in. 
it, they may not be expensive, but you know it, it starts to add up. And uh, you want to you, you're not trying to game the system. You're just trying to take it, get the number as accurate as possible. Exactly. And then that second stage, right, is in identifying and documenting your insurance proceeds. So you're tracking all your coverages, your dwelling, your ordinance and law, landscaping, trees, debris, extended replacement coverage, other structures, your contents, any scheduled property, even your additional living expenses. Um, one caution is if you purchase real property using your additional living expense, you need to track that expense and purchase as well because it could lead to a taxable gain. And the documentation, John, you know, that can include settlement letters, checks. If it's if it's muddy, you know, you've got one check from multiple pieces, ask your adjuster to give a breakout of the detail of that check so you know precisely what was hitting your, you know, what was in which bucket, right? Some of the insurance companies will will generate what they call a statement of loss or summary of loss. Uh, and some of them are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's one insurance company out there that uh, does a really good job in terms of being able to get to a number that they want to get to, but they're not really good in terms of, of uh, being straightforward in terms of the, the details that they're really uh, including in those numbers. So it's a, it's a matter of, of keeping every piece of paper that comes from the insurance company, including copies of the check and any, any voucher uh, payment voucher that comes with that check, because there might be things on there that will tell a story that might not be in other documentation. But yes, uh, the, the treatment of different categories uh, is, has different impact for tax purposes. When we're talking about a disaster in a pr primary residence, any money that you receive for contents will be, for all intents and purposes, tax-free. I'd like to disclose it because I like to tell the IRS a complete story. I figure the more, the more complete the story is, the less opportunity they're going to have to want to ask questions. And uh, But so even though those proceeds might be or are, are tax-free, I still disclose them. Uh, the on the on the other hand, um, if if the proceeds that you get for contents are less than your cost your cost basis and the fair market value, uh, then you might have a casualty loss, and you're still entitled to claim that casualty loss if, in fact, it computes out to 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 such. Uh, and as far as the the ALE. It is additional living expense. If you use that money, and sometimes people make a, I think sometimes it's a good economic decision to use that money to uh, buy a house, a, a temporary house, even though it might be a temporary house. But um, that is not additional living expense. That's the acquisition of an asset. And that is not treated as an offset against those ALE expenses and will likely generate uh, taxable income. Um, but your additional living expense generally is um, the rental that you're paying for a temporary home or hotels. And, and when you're staying at a hotel, then you also get to, to uh, uh, include things like uh, meals and, and stuff like that. Might be excess transportation where you're still having to get the, the kids to school, but it's uh, 10 miles each way more than it was before. So that's uh, that's a, a deductible against the additional uh, additional uh, uh, expense proceeds. Um, sometimes I've had clients that uh, one of their one of their therapies is to go out uh, antiquing, and uh, so they'll 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 find an antique. Well, they don't have a house to put the antique, so they rent a storage unit and they put these the these fines uh, that they buy in, in storage. Well, that storage cost is part of your additional living expense also. All right, thank you, John. And then stage three is um, documenting your recovery costs, right? Because the goal is to capture all the costs of rebuilding your home or purchasing that replacement home, uh, you know, permits, architect, testing, 
Um, and then the cost of replacement of lost personal property, right? So right. if you're re if you're rebuilding, it's documenting your contractor's costs, your permits, fees, architect, testing, um, all of those pieces. But if it's if you're buying a replacement home, it's the purchase price, required fixes, inspections, um, anything you want to share on on that piece. Well, just one of the things that seems to be a, a, a difficult thing for people to keep in mind is uh, debris uh, removal. Because a lot of times what happens is uh, the county comes in and does debris removal and then charges the insurance company directly for the debris removal uh, to the extent that the, the taxpayer has coverage for debris removal. Uh, and so uh, a lot of times that money doesn't pass through the hands of the taxpayer but in fact, the there's two transactions that are taking place. One is the insurance company has paid the taxpayer those dollars for the debris removal. And then the taxpayer has a second transaction where they've turned around and they've paid the debris removal, which becomes part of their replacement costs for the for the property. Got it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to touch on on one piece that we talked about earlier, just just a little deeper dive. Why does it matter what your disaster was designated? I mean, quite simply, it impacts your cash position and your tax options. Um, and John, I know you've you've talked about this. I'm just going to read through quickly. And if there's anything you want to add, okay. um, please please call out. So insurance proceeds and grants or gifts specifically designated for contents damaged or destroyed related to the primary residence are not subject to taxation if the disaster is federally declared, even if they cause a gain or a potential gain. Contents losses can be considered when calculating deductions for casualty losses. And remember, a casualty loss requires that DR federal disaster declaration. Uh, you may be able to amend your prior year's tax return and claim a loss if you sustained a loss as the IRS defines it. And finally, if your disaster did not get that DR designation, uh, then the insurance proceeds you collect for contents, personal property are reportable and may or may not be taxable. It, it just gets complicated, right? Correct. All right, let me go to the... Uh, this is how to, to verify if your disaster has a federal disaster declaration. You just literally go to this, this site on the on the FEMA site. Um, and then, you know, these are the provisions available if you have a DR. And then, John, I'm going to uh, touch, because you talked about it briefly, um, which payments may be taxable. And this is the slide that goes into that in a little more detail and has it all in one place. Um, for those impacted by a disaster loss, regardless of disaster declaration, taxable reimbursements will include unemployment compensation, payments for real estate, uh, can be treated the same as if they're proceeds paid by the insurance company. Some ALE insurance proceeds, like you said, if you used to purchase an asset rather than pay for those temporary living expenses, and then those contents, in, uh, contents insurance proceeds. Um, also, if you had a secondary home, the contents would may be taxable. Or there's there you may have have to deal with them separately in terms of re, repurchasing contents. And when we talk about this, is a always a confusing thing when people talk about ask about uh, replacing contents. You know. Um, if they had a, a a toaster and they go out and they buy a microwave, is that okay? Uh, it's just a general concept of, of contents. You don't have to worry about, well, I only had five pairs of shoes and now I'm buying 10 pairs of shoes. Uh, it, that's that's perfectly okay. It doesn't, it's not a quantity or even uh, a, a type of thing. So, you know, if, if you decide, well, um, I, I no longer want to have a couch. Uh, you don't have to buy a couch <laughs> just because uh, you had a couch and you got reimbursed for the couch. Now, the insurance company may have restrictions in terms of how they pay you for the couch that you've lost because they may say, well, we right. will pay based upon the 
actual cash value at the date of the fire. Uh, and they'll give you the difference between the actual cash value and the actual replacement cost only if you actually go out and buy the buy a replacement couch. But that's that's an insurance thing, not a tax thing. Thank you for making that distinction. And then on the reverse side, those non-taxable reimbursements um, can include payments for ALE to the extent, as you said, they're being used to pay for additional living expenses. And that would include both insurance proceeds and FEMA payments. Any payments from social welfare agencies, charitable organizations, and any of those in-kind services you might have received. Um, and also FEMA payments. And I'm not going to, we're not going to speak to code section 139, but just basically understand that FEMA payments are under this authority um, and it, it protects them. Uh, generally, they have no tax consequences. Sure. All right. And then let's keep going here. Um, and so, John, you know, how to determine cost basis for IRS purposes. So what we have on the slide is it's the purchase cost or the inherited cost is used, not the market value. And as you've outlined before, certain upgrades and additions can add to it. And then the inter integral nature rule for personal use real estate. And that's where you're saying that land, fences, home combined, can be combined and added to the co uh, cost basis. Exactly. All right, and then I am making sure I don't have anyone who had a question that was answered here. All right, and then, so if you're underinsured, you know, going back to that question of, don't you automatically have a loss for tax purposes? And so the slide says, no, because you may have actually had a gain in the IRS's view precisely for what you said. If you paid less from your home than the amount of your dwelling claim payment, uh, if you're if you if you're eligible to a, a claim a casualty loss, you have to have that federal disaster declaration DR. And the reminder that your insurance loss, uh, while, while you might be underinsured, that is different than your dwelling's cost basis for this casualty loss. Um, and, and, and we're going to dive in now into some of the ways to offset, uh, but I'm going to give everybody a deep breath first, and then John will go to your um, scenarios, and I will, I will read it to you, um, and then I'll let you explain what we're seeing on the screen. All right, and so scenario one. And this is based on uh, what you would have completed on form 4684. And John, would you just lightly touch on what that form is so that everyone well, it's a, it's a, a casualty. It's, a, it's the only form that the IRS has for these cases. They don't have a form for the involuntary conversion, but they do have a form for the to claim a casualty loss. And uh, there, the basic form uh, has two pages. One page one is for personal losses, and page two is for uh, investment and uh, and commercial losses. We're concentrating here on the personal losses. The line numbers that are that you see here, two through nine, uh, are the same line numbers on the forty on the form forty six eighty four page one. Line number one is the description of the property. And all right. Uh, well, let's let's start with scenario one, which is has line two cost basis is one hundred and seventy six thousand. Line three insurance is thirty thousand. Uh, gain is a, is a zero on line four. Line five value before loss one hundred and eighty thousand. Value after loss on line six fifty thousand. Your loss, your economic loss, as noted on line seven, which is five minus six. It's 130,000. Uh, line eight is the loss, which is the smaller of line two or seven, 130,000. And then on line nine, it says subtract line three from line eight. Um, and, and so it's saying the loss is 100,000. So the, as you can see, the calculation is that you get to deduct the lesser 
of the cost of the property, cost basis of the property, or the decrease in the fair market value. That's the general rule. And then whichever whichever of those two numbers is the lesser, then from that you deduct any proceeds that you've received. So this is this example uh, is designed to show a grossly underinsured situation. Uh, only thirty thousand dollars with the cost basis of of one hundred seventy six thousand. So uh, they they totally did not keep up with their their insurance with the uh, rising costs. So and we and we and we know that you know we we're keeping the number simple so the math is simpler. So if you take that as a magnitude of you know being underinsured by two thirds. Um, you know, it, it gives you an idea of the scope. All right. So for scenario two, John, our cost basis is 176,000. Insurance was 150. The gain on line four is a zero. Value before the loss on line five is 180,000. Value after the loss on line six is 50. Again, that economic loss on line seven is 130. Uh, line eight uh, it's uh, the loss, the smaller of line two or seven, it's 130. And then line nine says the, the loss is a zero. So uh, the situation here is the same as the one in the prior one, except we're a little bit better insured. Uh, maybe not as insured as fully as we would like to be, but we're, we're uh, better off here in terms of the insurance. And and because the insurance of 150 is greater than our economic loss of 130, we don't have a loss. We don't have a gain either, by the way. We don't have a gain because the, the proceeds we received, the 150, is less than our cost basis of 176. So this is this is a this would get reported, but it's basically a non uh, a non-event for purposes of the of, ta of taxes. Got it. Thank you. And so our third scenario, cost basis again, 176, insurance proceeds 150, gain on line four is a zero, but the value before the loss is 300,000 on line five, value after the loss is 120,000, line seven's economic loss is 180,000. Uh, your loss on line eight is 176. And then on line nine, the loss is 26,000. So in this case, uh, the property is appreciated in value. And so we end up with a decrease in value of 180. It turns out that that, that is greater than our cost basis. And so the limitate the limiting factor in this in this one is the cost basis. Whereas the limiting factor in the other two examples was the decrease in in uh, in value, um, why would we have a, a three hundred thousand dollar be before and one hundred twenty thousand dollars after? Well, uh, probably this is real estate, and the one hundred twenty represents the value of the the remaining lot. Uh, so the house and lot had a value. Could have sold it before the fire for three hundred thousand dollars, but after the fire, there's only uh, debris uh, sitting on that lot, uh, and now uh, it has a value of only one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So the de decrease in value is that one hundred eighty thousand. And this, John, this is something you saw with a lot of folks in the Woolsey and the Thomas fires. Am I correct in saying that, that all the, all the, the land was so valuable? Yeah. Yeah. This is this is this is probably this is the most common situation. Well, this is the most common situation where there's a casualty loss, uh, but uh, most of them will, will be more like the next slide. <laughs> right, and let's let's go to our more common slide. So, uh, scenario four: cost basis one hundred and twenty-six thousand, insurance proceeds on line three one hundred and fifty. Your gain on line four is twenty-four thousand. So. In this case, um, what we have is a, a lower cost basis. So that's what uh, what, what caused the uh, the gain. And now if, and, and 
we could fill out the form and line four would then, if we filled out the form like this and uh, we filed it, line four would end up being carried forward to the to Schedule D as a capital gain and the taxpayer would pay taxes on that 24000 So you would not, you would, and I want to emphasize that, you would not use this form. You would say, okay, I don't have a casualty loss. I'm not going to use this form. I'm going to report this as an involuntary conversion. And that is a whole separate set of, of rules that come into play. And, and you're not going to have to pay taxes if you do the right things on that $24,000. Well, and we're going to jump now to, do you have a casualty loss? And while we know it's probably not the case, we do want to go through so you understand what it what it would look like, right? Um, but just to start with, it's very rare that it's established and documented. Um, and, and just understand that it's not necessarily bad news to not have a casualty loss, right, John? Oh, it, it's actually a good thing because because you're you're probably closer to being having adequate insurance. Got it. And so, um, personal casualty loss is the lesser of, as as your examples have shown, the cost basis of the damage or destroyed property, or the decline in fair market value using before and after the the casualty, and then dot 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 reduced by all insurance proceeds, payments, and uh, proceeds. Because uh, remember, you're not going to have a loss greater than your cost basis. Yeah, I want to just uh, just kind of uh, addendum the, uh, what you said there. When we say all proceeds, this would be all proceeds for that for that asset category. So uh, when you're looking at the the proceeds that you received for the um, when you're looking to determine if you have a casualty loss. For, for the house, for the real property, you would not include as part of those proceeds, the proceeds you receive for ALE or the proceeds that you receive for contents. That would be a separate, the contents calculation would be a separate calculation and the ALE has nothing to do with the casualty loss. The ALE is, is, is providing uh, assistance after the event and is not, is, is due to the event, but is not because, is not, reimbursement be, because of the event. Got it. So so when we're talking about you're starting with these two pieces of information, those first two bullets and then the uh, the insurance proceeds, it's for that category. So dwelling, dwelling, contents, contents. Right. Got it. Thank you for clarifying. And we're going to touch on that form 4684 that you gave us the four scenarios. Um, and as you said, if you don't have a casualty loss, you don't file that form. Um, and 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 this is very important to note. And there were several people that had questions about this in the Q and A. Excuse me, not the Q and A. And the pre-submitted questions. While this is the only form the IRS provides for disaster taxes, there's publication five four seven that explains if you have a gain how you must provide a statement that's attached to your tax returns with all the all circumstances reported. It lists 15 items to be uh, addressed. And it's important to note, uh, there, there are no examples to give anyone of how, how to document. You have to just address what the IRS has requested and different CPAs document those 15 points in different ways. Um, and then, the most important thing, don't think you don't have to report something just because there's not a form for it, right, John? Correct. Uh, and and also, and the, the scary uh, part is it's so complex, the IRS can't even provide a form for reporting. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm yeah. stealing your um, your thunder there. Yes, you. I've, I've done this with you enough. I remember the buzzwords there. <laughs> Which is really frightening that if the if, if the IRS can't provide a form for reporting, how do you know you got it right? I, I understand why people get really stressed. So, so let's 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 jump now to how to substantiate that casualty loss. Uh, it uh, it's similar to what's required for insurance companies, and in that you have to show some of the same 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 information, right? Type of loss, date of the occurred, loss was a direct result of the disaster, right? Proof you owned it um, or contractually liable if it was leased. 
Um, now, that doesn't there, mean you have to supply it, a copy of the deed with the tax return. You don't. Right. Right. And then that document to support the claimed loss. And that's that's that more aligns with, um, you know, when you're um, presenting the house as was with all the improvements to substantiate what you had and that insurance negotiations. A lot of that feels, um, you know, similar to that. But, you know, as you said, it's um, it's not it's not the same. And so don't focus on what your insurance company gave you is going to be adequate to do that. And so the next slide, we're going to talk about determining that amount of loss, right? Um, so we've got, you could do the appraisal method, you, you cost of repairs with receipts, safe harbor, sorry, safe harbor computations. Um, and then two things to note, obviously the year to de deduct the loss sustained or the prior year, and the loss can't exceed the cost basis. On the, and I just, like this, we noted here that you have two general methods, the appraisal method and the cost of repair method. The cost of repair method is very difficult to use and generally does not give you as good a result as you might get with the appraisal method. Now, with the appraisal method, it requires two appraisals and uh, some appraisers are not able to figure out how to do this and it's a question of finding the, the right appraiser who understands the process. But there's an appraise, those appraisals are almost a nanosecond apart. So the, the appraise, the first appraisal, the value before is how much would that house have sold according to an appraiser, the appraiser um, just before the, the event. And the value after is literally right after the event has occurred. And I want to emphasize right after, because right after the lot is burdened with debris and that debris has an impact on the fair market value and will decrease the, the, the value. There is one other piece though, that the IRS is concerned about and that they think uh, in, in, most, in most of these cases that the, the value immediately after is depressed temporarily by the the devastation, the widespread, the, the appearance of the community, et cetera. And they they take the position that, that that part of that decrease will rebound maybe in a year or two. And that needs to be taken into consideration and basically uh, factored out of the, the, the decrease. So on one hand, you've got just the the value of what that lot might might get in a pristine position uh, after the after the fire, um, and then you get to decrease it by the the debris, but then you have to increase it uh, the value by the uh, uh, this this temporary what they call temporary buyer resistance and appraisers uh, that's up to them to come up with that number and, and justify. Sometimes I've seen. They, they use 10% uh, or 15%. Uh, maybe they're comparing a, a, a fire to a, another another recent event and seeing what the the, uh, the price rebound was in that case where uh, the values might have been $100,000 immediately after. And yet uh, two or three years later, it went up to 100, 110 or 115,000. So they'll adjust for that that percentage, uh, in in, uh, in in come up with a uh, an adjusted appraisal amount. Got it. And that feeds into that information needed to report the loss as well. And, and, so and, and yes, and those and those appraisals actually get attached to the tax return. They go go. The IRS wants to wants copies of those appraisals. All right. Well, thank you for pointing that out. And then um, uh, we had uh, three bullets just talking about what to know about reporting. Uh, so your gain on unscheduled property is not taxable. No re tax reporting disclosure necessary. If it was your primary personal residence in a federally declared disaster, that DR designation, your proceeds on scheduled property is separate from unscheduled and will be treated as if it were real property, right? Cost of scheduled property is added to the cost basis of real property. 
Um, and the note was, and insurance proceeds get added to real property proceeds, so treated as one single item of property. Yeah, most most people don't have scheduled property. I think uh, in the years that I've been doing this, I think I've had three cases where people have had right. scheduled property. But uh, basically, you know, I'll I'll ask people, you know, do you have scheduled property? And if I get a great glazed look on the back, I said, you probably don't have it. But uh, it's basically where you've got an expensive, very valuable item that uh, you want to make sure is covered by insurance. And so you get a separate writer for that item. So it might be a piece of expensive jewelry. Um, it might be a, 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 an expensive piece of artwork or uh, a, an antique. It might be a gun collection, things that might be a little bit dicey in terms of, of uh, insurance uh, insurance coverage. And so uh, the taxpayer gets specific coverage on that item, then those that's considered scheduled property. Got it. And now let's hop over back to the, uh, do you have an involuntary conversion gain? And as your scenarios uh, showed, while it was the last example, it's the most common one, especially if your home was purchased many years ago and the values have risen, which is the case in most of the states we're looking at now. And yes, you can have a gain even if you're underinsured, but those IRS regulations that you called out before can help offset or defer that gain from these all um, involuntary conversions. And then for um, in the questions, um, uh, we had a, a question with a couple that had a um, a cabin that was uh, purchased as a, a you know not not even with a mortgage as a property loan, um, and they made substantial improvements. Um, and so while they're incredibly underinsured because that cost basis, they would have to do all that documenting um, to to prove that they would have, um, uh, you know, a, a casualty loss. It's more likely that they would have that involuntary conversion gain because they had done so many so many improvements in the insurance while they're underinsured. It's going to be enough to replace the properties. Right. All right. And let me go to the, all right. So talking about the gain, can you defer it? All right, so the involuntary conversion gain occurs if those payments reimbursements exceed the cost basis of the property. And so if it's your personal primary residence, um, John, you uh, talked about this before and we, we did pull up the slide on the exclusion to offset the gain under sale of personal residence roles. Right. So IRC one, section 121. Right, 121. So, uh, We've got we've got the uh, the gain, and if you've satisfied the requirements of 121, you get all or part of, of that full 121, and then you can use that against against that gain, and it might wipe out the gain. It's it's very possible that it might uh, wipe out all of the gain, and you don't even have a, a, a you don't have a, a gain to worry about, and you you could be done, uh, but. Uh, if you if your proceeds are exceed uh, the the amount of of your cost basis plus that one twenty one, then you still have a gain that uh, and you have to reinvest the total of the proceeds less the one twenty one ex exclusion in order not to pay taxes on the gain portion. And when you're spending money on replacement property, the the way the IRS looks at looks at it logically, the first money that gets spent replaces and rebuilds that original cost basis. And then once that original cost basis has been rebuilt, then you start eating away at that, uh, at that gain that you, that, uh, that you've uh, realized and, and, uh, and you get, get to defer. There are uh, requirements um, in terms of when you have to get this all completed and this can be very confusing because the rule is that you have to determine the year of gain. So uh, let's say in the case of uh, a 2023 loss that uh, the taxpayers received some money in 23, but they haven't re they haven't received money in excess of their cost basis plus that 121 exclusion. But then in 2024, 
they receive additional money that now tips the scales and now they are in a gain position. So 2024 becomes the gain year. And uh, for primary personal residents, then they would have four years after the end of 2024. So they would have through 2028 to replace that property um, and rebuild, replace, whatever, uh, whichever. And um, if, if they're not done, uh, and I hate to say that it's not uncommon for people not to be done after that four year period, uh, it is possible to get extensions. Um, I've, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, and that that really you need um, two things, right? You need their consent and reasonable cause. Yes, and also in terms of in terms of of, of making making the election, uh, you actually have to file file with uh, part of the the process with the involuntary conversion is actually making an election to defer the gain. This is not not an automatic thing. You actually have to say, okay, yeah, I have this gain, but I'm going to defer it uh, under uh, 1033 H1 uh, if it's a primary personal residence. And John, like when, when you're attaching that statement with those reasons, like I know, I know people now with the Thomas fire from 2017 who are just finishing their rebuild. So obviously they've exceeded that time frame, um, and there were, there were extenuating circumstances with a lawsuit and other stuff. Um, and, and that's the kind of detail you'd have to provide. You can't just say, I'm not finished. You need to provide reasonable details, right? Right. Right. Um, and, and the IRS is fairly liberal in terms of uh, giving those extensions, uh, but the extension, generally speaking, uh, taking that example that where the, the uh, taxpayers' uh, replacement period ends at the end of 2028 and they're not complete, well, at, at December of 2028, they would have to file a request for an extension, and the IRS only grants those a year at a time. Uh, but if things slip and they don't get the, the extension in by the end of December of 2028 and they get it in, you know, a little bit into 2029, uh, the IRS will still act upon it and will still treat it as a valid application. So the that that cutoff period of December 31st is not absolute, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be abused. I mean, there there have been extenuating circumstances where I have uh, I've had to ask the IRS for uh, uh, delayed extend, de delayed extension requests where it's more than a month or two. Uh, and, and they have generally been uh, accommodating. Well, I, I haven't, so far I haven't been, been denied, but uh, that doesn't mean it won't happen in the future. <laughs> Got it, thank you. All right, and so um, the, the the slide, and we've already you've already been talking about this, is the how long do you have to replace the property with the involuntary conversion gain, um, and then if it's not a DR, they have the two years. But if it, if it's if it's a disaster, but it's not a DR, are they also able to get the extensions? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so that piece, it's still flipped for anyone, regardless of whether you're a DR or just a, a, a non-federally de declared yes. disaster. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. And then uh, this is something people are doing. Uh, can I buy multiple properties to offset that involuntary conversion gain? You know, buying smaller multiple properties uh, the bullet says there's no limit on the number of replacement properties to avoid taxation on that involuntary conversion gain, but um, they must be similar or related. So personal use real estate would qualify. You couldn't go buy an office building, right? Correct. Um, or, 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 a, or buy a house, but convert it immediately to rental use. Right. That would um, not count. And then, um, and with contents, and you've already touched on this, so the, you know, that the contents, that acquisition doesn't necessarily need to be identical. Unlike insurance that will say, we're only going to, if you had a king size, I had a queen and you want to go up to the king, they're going to say, we're only going to owe you for this. 
the IRS is, it's a bed, it's a bed. And, you know, and they're happy with that. Well, they don't even care if you buy a bed. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, you could buy, you could, you could use the money buying sleeping bags if you want to. Got it. Yeah. And then, and we've already talked about the replacement time periods, as you said, either followed or ask for them and provide documentation in that statement to request they be formally extended. Right. I'm going to talk, so selling the lot, because I know this is, is a, it's, it's a complicated issue, especially for a lot of our Marshall fire folks. Uh, if you sell your lot, will the proceeds be taxable? And so three bullets here, the sale of the residual land can in most cases be treated the same as if it is pro proceeds received from insurance. It will likely be substantially all gain. And if you've applied your exclusion fully prior to the sale, if you have not, if you have not full, sorry, let me repeat this. If you have not fully used your exclusion, you can apply it to the land sale, but only if the sale closed within two years of the date of the loss. Correct. Okay. All right. And then let me go on to the reporting an involuntary conversion deferred gain. <laughs> and so as you've said, it's uh, 15 points. There's a document to, um, uh, no document, no form to complete, but that reporting is required annually. And that's where you're detailing the overall and current status of the reimbursement process, right? right. Um, and the replacement reinvestment process, as, as well as all that other data and information. Like you said, they might not care about contents, but you're you're looking at providing everything so that they don't say we have questions, right? That's right. Also, on the purchase of contents, and this is one of the most difficult things for people to understand because it it it, it is totally against all logic. But um, for the primary personal residence the money that you spend on contents is treated the same as if you spent that money on the real property itself. And so what ends up happening is one, uh, maybe you didn't, maybe your replacement property, uh, you don't use all of the proceeds uh, or need all the proceeds to buy the, the replacement property to, to, to complete the replacement of the, the home, maybe you decide, hey, I had a five bedroom house and I'm only going to rebuild a, a three bedroom house or something, you know, so you're spending less than the proceeds. Uh, but the contents money gets treated, this, not the contents money, the contents purchases get treated the same as the putting the money into that into that house. So that has the benefit of absorbing some of those insurance proceeds that you have to reinvest. And also some of that gain that is being deferred gets allocated to those contents. And for all intents and purposes, it will never be taxable ever in the future because all of those contents are the are of the type of things that uh, generally are not going to go up in value. You know, the toaster oven's not going to increase in value. Uh, the, uh, the bed is not going to increase in value. The couch is not going to increase in value. The shoes are going to wear out. Um, so in effect, it, it's also another uh, means by which we get to really make some of that gain disappear. And that's a large part of it. Well, it, it could be 10, 15 percent of the gain that, uh, that, that uh, you know, it's not it's not going to be probably not the bulk of it unless unless you you're an overbuyer on, on the contents. But but it surely helps. All right, thank you. Well, we're going to jump on to our other considerations. And these are um, just, you know, you have to think about what are your circumstances? Did you have a rental property, a second home? You know, talking about those number of replacement properties that we've already touched on. Do you have a trust? Are you selling the lot? Lawsuit settlements, if you're dealing with a divorce or death, a change in use, looking at business losses and taxes, you know, you need to, you need to have that context of um you know uh, what you're looking at because it's uh, you you just need to you know know what you're walking into when you go and we're going to jump on to 
so tax treatment for uh, of funds for ALE. And John, you've talked about this, uh, you know, a, a fair bit. I just, this is kind of a wrap up slide. Um, uh, so in, in all cases, including a DR, insurance proceeds for ALE and other funds received for temporary rent, they're not taxable as long as they're applied to, towards those actual living expense, expenses. Um, and this is expenses after the event, not part of the disaster itself. They're not part of your casualty loss calculations. If you have excess insurance proceeds, they're taxable in the year, you're no longer incurring those expenses. Um, and then those out-of-pocket payments for ALE that insurance did not cover are not deductible. However, you know, we, we've already looked at the slide on uh, if you're buying a replacement home, and we've already talked about how this works. Um, so I just it's wanted to recap home. those, yeah. All right, and then the next slide is what about legal and litigation proceeds? And uh, we start with the disclaimer, these require complex analysis and depend on what type of litigation. Um, and it can take years for these actions to play out for a uh, to a final outcome. And you've already outlined that non-physical injury claims that align with real property ALE, ALE and contents are gonna be treated roughly like insurance reimbursements. So they could be considered taxable, right? Uh, because they're going to go into your your calculations for loss and gain, right? Right. Well, um, but but that emotional distress and personal loss of income are taxable, um, and um, compensation for medical injury, med medical care, and bodily injury are not taxable. And then for rental property loss of income, you said you can deduct the legal fees as ordinary, necessary business expense, kind of like mortgage interest, right? right? Well, I mean, if you're getting, if you're getting loss of income on a rental property, that's going to get, that's going to get uh, reported on schedule E, the rental, the rental income schedule, and then the legal fees that you incurred to collect that loss of income become a deduction on that, on that same schedule. Got it. Thank you. And so a little, little, deeper dive on the reporting the business related losses. So is that different much than personal losses? Uh, and so you said there's a, a different standard for qualified replacement property for business losses. Um, that gain on involuntary conversion calculations is similar to personal property with these differences though, right? The land is not included unless the land is sold due to it being no longer economically viable to the owner. There's no exclusion on the gain available. Uh, your deduction is not limited by 10% of AGI and $100. Uh, and the loss must be substantiated by providing an inventory, uh, your depreciation schedule, and, and all of that helps you determine your cost basis. Right. Now, the and sometimes this, this also provides an opportunity because uh, Without a disaster, if your if your rental property burns down, then you have to reinvest in rental property. If your uh, uh, ice cream shop burns down and you get reimbursed and you want to not uh, pay taxes on that money, you have to reinvest in another ice cream shop. But if it's a disaster, then uh, the flex the flexibility is is increased tremendously. Um, the definition of replacement property is property of a type held for productive use in a trade or business, which means pretty much anything. I like to uh, think of uh, as, as kind of a, a far, maybe a little bit far out example, but you know, the person has got a, uh, uh, a, a, a card shop and decides, well, I don't want to send, sell uh, greeting cards anymore and uh, goes out and buys a couple of ta taco trucks. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the, also, the person who has the rental property, well, they can go out and put the money back into another rental property, but they can also put that money into, again, my favorite, the taco trucks. So there's a lot of flexibility there. In terms right. Of what you can it, what you can reinvest in. Right, and then and and the question about can you defer that uh, business uh, involuntary conversion gain? It's all the so, all the yeah all the same yeah yeah, 
And then uh, the next slide is about um, uh, having uh, tax implications from losing a second home. So as we've mentioned earlier, there's no exclusion available. It's not your primary home. You have two years to replace beginning the calendar year when the total proceeds exceed the cost basis. And again, you can ask the, if you have good reasons, you can ask the IRS for an extension one year at a time. Um, it's that same bundling of the land, the landscaping, building improvements, building itself, all one integral unit or one number. Um, but unlike the primary residence, uh, the contents proceeds are subject to rev regular recovery rules, right? You have to determine well, the, the, the basis. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the contents are treated this, uh, in a separate category but all the rules that apply to the real property apply. So you, if you have a gain, you've got that two year period to replace. Uh, the, the money that you spend on replacement contents are not combined with the money that you, are not combined as part of the real property uh, reinvestment. So they're, they are totally separate. There's a, there's a separate transaction, separate reporting for, for the contents. And you, like I've got a, I've got a client right now that, um, their their uh, their replacement period for their real property uh, a two year replacement period expired in 2023 because they they had a gain in 2021, but they didn't settle with the insurance company and get all their proceeds for the contents until 2022. So they actually have until 2024 to replace the tw the uh, the contents. Got it. Thank you for thank you for giving those real examples. That's very helpful. Um, tax implications for lo from losing a rental property. So rentals are considered investment property. You're um you're there's no loss of rental income because you just don't pay taxes on the rental income you didn't receive, right? Right. Uh, but if you're not insured, yes, you might have a casualty loss. But uh, and it's this, but it's really going to be real tough because if you've owned that property for any number any significant number of years, you've depreciated a, a lot of the cost. You're not in, you're not including the land, so you've got a fairly low cost basis. And if you've gotten any insurance proceeds, most likely you've got a a, a gain. But right. So um, unless you were uninsured, you right. most yeah you should have a gain. And actually, that gets that you hit on this, exactly on the next bullet. Um, you you know you've got to have the rental properties depreciation schedule from those previous tax return uh, tax returns to help you because uh, you've got to identify the items lost. And as you said, the land's not lost; it's not part of the loss. Um, you know, landscaping, building, all of that goes in there. And and we've mentioned earlier how to get those returns. And then, John, the last slide is, do I want, need professional help? Um, so adhering to the time limits, uh, uh, allowances established by the tax code and reporting are extremely important to protect your resources. Failing to report a disaster loss event on a tax return could result in a totally avoidable penalties and loss of valuable tax opportunities, as you were outlining. Um, and, and just the reality is it's difficult to correctly calculate and claim a casualty loss. Uh, reporting an involuntary conversion is even more difficult because there's no form to fill out. Um, and the, the changing rules in this complexity really just make it wise to seek advice from a qualified uh, vetted uh, expert in this area. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that TurboTax and Tax Act do not deal with the complexities you might normally do your taxes yourself and be very savvy, uh, but but this is one of those areas where you you know I I would recommend professional help. It's you just want to get it right. So anything to throw out there, John? Uh, it, it, I I totally agree with you, but I I I don't want to add anything more to that. But it, it's all right. True. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm going to run through our closing slides here. So we'd like for you to stay informed, uh, to be added to our mailing list for future events. Um, please sign up here to request a copy of the slides or the video. You can either visit our events at page 
on our website or send an email and we will get that out to you once it's posted on. We recommend connecting to our, um, our team up volunteers on our Survivor Survivor forums. Um, take advantage of that. It's a great, uh, a great resource for crowdsourcing questions and answers and resources, but also that emotional support. Um, if you were in Hawaii, this is how you would contact your Department of Insurance. Colorado, uh, you have the Colorado Division of Insurance and California, the California Department of Insurance. Uh, these are resources here that you as a taxpayer are supporting that should be supporting you in this. So please take advantage of them. Uh, upcoming uh, Roadmap to Recovery events, as I mentioned on our website here at events, you can both register for upcoming events and also view recordings and obtain resources provided in past events as well. Um, our Ask an Expert forum is a place for you to get your individual questions answered. Please take advantage of it. And I'd like to thank our funders who enable us to be here today. Uh, so thank you to uh, our CRC, Golden State Finance Authority, and the Community Foundation of Boulder County. And uh, that is a wrap. John, thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Uh, Amy, you can stop recording. <laughs>